Are you pulling a tanner and not running the intro? <laughs> <laughs> absolute garbage at our intros and videos yeah. now well and i totally forgot you know i'm not used to the new studio yet that it's black so i look like a floating head here i think so i'm taking <laughs> off the, the i'm wearing a black shirt hoodie. i'm wearing a black shirt too damn chuck just there we turned go. up this podcast a notch got there we go need hey tim play nelly hot in here uh bum, really. bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs> all right chuck let's uh let's dive into this week's news uh let's get off the topic of you taking off your your sweatshirt and your shirt yes so story number one shell came out this week they announced that they had to divert seven billion dollars to cash to cover margin calls on their hedges and it was primarily all on their natural gas hedges and I bring this up kind of first because this is a big deal and this is the first time we've seen this. You know, natural gas is at what the eight or nine year high, pushing up over six dollars per M. And all these guys that are hedged at two dollars and fifty cents, three dollars are having to post margin calls. It's kind of crazy. Seven right? billion is a lot. I mean, they <laughs> sold what did they sell the Permian for? Like nine billion. So they basically took the Permian and placed it into margin. You know, we were at a PE shop the other day and I made a joke about, you know, kind of like sarcastically, like, oh, I know you guys are hurting in $100 oil. And then, you know, they said under their breath, like, yeah, hedged at 60. (laughs) And we were grateful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's kind of wild that you see these things uh, happening. And why don't you give us like real quick rundown on what a margin call is for someone that may not know? Yeah. So if you're a small private equity backed company, you generally have a line of credit with a bank. So think Wells Fargo, Citibank, whoever, and you do your hedges through their desk. And because they have a lien on your oil and gas assets for the loan, you don't have to post margin. So if you hedge it three bucks, they're like, okay, we know they're going to sell that MCF in the future. They're going to get three bucks, you know, so they'll realize six bucks. They'll send us the, the difference. What happens if you're a big guy like a shell, probably diamondback, probably pioneer, your debt is unsecured bonds. Mm-hmm. And so what you do is you just go, hedge by trading on um the uh cme and you you know you go you short you go long whatever you want to do but each one of those contracts that you enter whether it's locking in your price or whatever uh, is a levered contract and so if i sell um puts if you would well that's not good if i lock in a contract at three dollars and it goes to six the counterparty is sitting there saying whoa time out you got to prove to me you're going to be able to pay this and generally you're going to have to post the difference between six and three yeah in cash in your account at your broker that you trade with the nymex through yeah i liked um you know during the um, kind of quarantine with the rise of retail trading on the Robinhood app. You know, Robinhood, I don't know if you've actually been through the process of signing up for an options account on Robinhood, but it's kind of scary how easy it is to access options and margin trading. And a lot of people don't know how margin works. So you always see all these posts on Wall Street bets like, I just got margin called. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, they owe Robinhood like 10 grand or whatever to uh cover a trade so essentially you know these big operators they're trading on margin so they're levered trades and if it gets too far out of the money then they have to cover that with cash yeah and so why this is a big deal is everybody kind of knew people had been hedged and you see the price run up so you know there's going to be some call for folks to have to post margin so one it's a use of cash two for all the politicians, and maybe this is a hint towards what finger of the week is, but with all these politicians going, oil's at 100 and all that, you may only be realizing 60 for it. 
Yeah. And, and so that's, that's kind of a real, Which, real issue. You know, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter dunking on EMPs for being hedged, but this is actually something me and Bomber agree on um which me and bomber agree on a lot i don't know what i'm saying like i don't think the only thing we don't agree on <laughs> is <did>. bitcoin <laughs> um but bomber and i were talking because all these people are dunking on companies for hedging and it's like these are large corporations they have to hedge you're running a business you know you got to flatten out the uh highs highs and lows and so cool you know you can be like a sandridge and just raw dog it and have no hedges <laughs> and you know get all the upside but um, you know, look at how Sandridge has performed historically. It's not the right way to run a company. So I know a lot of these EMPs get busted up online about being hedged at $60, $70 when you have $100. But I mean, in hindsight, that was probably the the right. I mean, if you go back to, you know, when they put those hedges in, um, there's probably the right move. And, you know, I'm so unqualified to talk about hedge books. Like, I don't understand <laughs> hedging strategies well, at all. But I think the other thing that's missed by the market out there is it's it's a cost of capital tool. because, And we'll just do some real simple math here. Let's say we go buy something for 100 and we do it all with equity. And because of the price run up, uh, or because we drill good wells or whatever, in five years we sell it 200. So we made two times our money um, during that five year period. Now let's take the same scenario where we buy something for 100, but we use 50% debt, 50% levered. So we cut a $50 million equity check and a $50 million debt check, and we sell for 200 in year five and let's assume interest rates are zero even though they're not there'll be a little leakage for that yeah but when you sell for 200 and you pay the 50 back you got 150 so you made 150 million on your equity on an investment of 50 million mm -hmm. so you made 3x same scenario just different capital structures and so what i think the market misses is and and i had this discussion with somebody i think it was trisha curtis trisha was saying well, prices are low. You, of course, you should be unhedged. Well, then you're cutting a 100% equity check because a borrower will not let you borrow money at 2 and 3 and 4 and 5% interest if it's unhedged. So you, it, it's somewhat circular in that um, you have to look at it as kind of cost of capital. And I would rather have certainty on a two and a half times my money than to bet on product price because if you're going to do that just go trade on the nymex you know go trade commodities yeah if that I mean, makes that's, sense and that's kind of like what i was going back to like i mean look when me and jake bought some oil wells in 2018 some little strip of wells you know had the thesis that hey oil is going to run up and this would be a great way to have direct commodity exposure and we can make a quick flip on these and then guess what that didn't happen <laughs> and then you, uh, I learned very quickly that I do not want to operate oil and gas wells. <laughs> is the long, long story short there. But I mean, that's completely different than an EQT who has, you know, thousand employees or whatever it may be. And they got to actually run a full on operation and corporation and, you know, have advanced uh, financing strategies and things of that nature. So, um, you know, I understand why companies like that have to hedge, you know, mm -hmm. You know, I walk around here saying that hedging's for pussies, but um, also understand that corporations have to run a different a different model. But so yeah. let's let's discuss that. If we could guarantee the revenue at next year's Empower, would you do it? Mm. <laughs> Maybe mm. thinking a little different now. Hedging ain't so bad after all, <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be nice to be able to plan around guaranteed revenue. So yeah, no, I remember the day around here when we uh, basically had broken even on uh, Empower, and it was a good day. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, was, stress level goes down stress, a little just bit. A, just a little bit, yeah. yes. So, cool. Got, All our, right. got our lesson on hedging there. Next story I want to move to uh, was a really interesting story um, that didn't seem to get a lot of coverage. Uh, just uh, I saw a couple things about it on Twitter. But Nextera, um, which if you're not familiar with Nextera, I mean, 
Nextera is an energy company. They have both oil and gas assets and renewable assets. A lot of people don't seem to know about their oil and gas operations. If you look at their probably stock- by design, yeah, 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 it's genius design. Um, if you look at their uh, stock performance over you know the last uh, five years or so compared to other energy companies, I mean they're uh, clearly outperforming. But they were found guilty of killing 150 bald eagles and golden eagles up in Wyoming at one of their uh, wind turbine farms. Um, So they had uh, over $8 million in fines and thought this was really interesting because you always hear about wind turbines killing birds. And I've always kind of written it off as just kind of like, you know, it's just a talking point that um, anti-renewable folks use. And, you know, honestly, like if you're killing crows and shit, who cares? <laughs> but these are bald eagles. And I don't know if you've ever seen a bald eagle. I lived up in the Pacific Northwest for a few years. And, man, bald eagles are majestic. Like when you see one, yeah. I mean, it's just like, holy shit, like this is amazing and just to think about those things getting chopped up by wind turbines is well, crazy is it, and, is it chop or do they just because the wind turbines move slow yeah, they move slow. They're, they just run, they're just running don't, into don't them, they yeah, fly into it and break breaking, their neck breaking their neck yeah. and falling yeah so yeah. but less graphic I mean, for the kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when i say chopped up i mean just like you know they're they're flying through these uh wind turbine farms and hitting the blades but anyways someone replied to my comment but like, they're like, <laughs> they're like, yeah, but this was over 10, 10 years. I'm like, dog, that's 15 eagles a year. Can you imagine? That we know about. That we know. Yeah. yeah. That, and it was very clear. 150 that are documented that we know right. about. And what we do know also is that there are crews that will go out to these wind turbine farms first thing in the morning and pick up the birds <laughs> before <laughs> they're reported. Before right? anyone sees it. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, next era you know, it's found guilty. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting in there that you had comments from, um, the, uh, wildlife, uh, department. I, I can't remember the official name of the, uh, agency there in Wyoming, but said that, you know, next era or the operator wasn't cooperating with them, knew this was an issue and wasn't cooperating. So that's why they were so strict on this. Um, but, yeah, I thought that comment that I got on Twitter was interesting. It's like, oh, well, this is over 10 years. And I'm like, that's a lot of eagles over 10 years. And if you had a drilling rig, I mean, you know this um, from some of uh, your portfolio companies at Kane, but the Permian Basin, I mean, there was a legitimate threat to shut it down, I believe back in like 2013 over some desert lizard endangered there was, there was a lizard and then there was a special kind of plant life that i thought looked like a weed but yeah yeah but was, and we had you know in california um we had a field out there the kettleman middle dome that literally was surrounded by the blunt nose leopard lizard yeah. that's on the endangered species list. And the reason it was endangered is because it's the single stupidest animal on the planet. It would run and jump into the side of a truck and commit suicide <laughs> in effect. But every time we had one of those die, we had to have an autopsy by a biologist and prove that it was uh, natural causes and that we didn't cause it. Yeah, I mean, there's this thing called natural selection, right? Yeah. Um, not all species <laughs> are meant to survive. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think about the, the double standard here. If that was an oil rig, I mean, even in West Texas, you were so protective of the cattle of cows and the measures that you go through to protect those cows is insane. And then you go up to the North slope. I was talking on Twitter the other day, you know, I think I'm one of the only people, um, on Twitter that's uh, that's trained in polar bear survival <laughs> and people are like, I would love to know what that actually learned something new about you. Every what, day. What, what's involved in polar bear survival. And I'm like, I'm going to tell you right now, there's not much involved. It's like, you try to get away. <laughs> you try to run away. Um, you don't Chuck, have much- I have to outrun you. <laughs> yes, that's exactly <laughs> it. It's like, hope that you're in a, in a pair of threes and be the fastest out of the, out of those three people. Um, but pretty much like you can't do anything to that polar bear. Um, they're so protected 
and you actually have to call in a, a native a, a Inuit to come remove the polar bear um, out of the area. You can't try to scare it off, get it out. Like you cannot disturb that polar bear. So the measures that the oil and gas industry goes to to protect wildlife spent so much time on offshore uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico. You so much lose your hard hat if it blows over the handrail. I mean, you're getting written up, ran off. They have to file a report with uh, Bessie. Like, I mean, super strict when it comes to wildlife. And um, I just imagine if we had a rig out in West Texas that was just somehow killing 15 oh, eagles dude. a year, like, don't think that would fly. Yeah. And, and the, the whole point is not to trash on wind. It's just to be realistic about the issues and circumstances facing each one of these energy supplies. We got to be real about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And also to learn from it, like what kind of surveys and analysis needs to be ran. You know, I feel for next era because you put up, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, wind turbine project costs, but you put it up and then what can you do at that point? Like, oh shit, it's killing eagles. Got to take it down. A big net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a big net around. Yeah. Yeah. Big, a big eagle net <laughs> around the facility. <laughs> um, so, you know, sympathetic to them and that, but also, um, you know, if wildlife department says that you're not cooperating or working with them to take measures, you know, if the wildlife department's giving you advice and you're not taking it, then, um, you know, you yeah, kind of get what it's coming to you. So anyways, interesting story there. Um, so real quick, before we leave that story, I have a trivia question for you. Everyone pretty much in the energy business knows that Denmark, receives the highest percentage of its electricity from wind generation, mm -hmm. almost 50%. Who is number two on the list in the whole wide world? What country gets the most of their electricity from wind besides Denmark? Ooh, Because I did not know this. That's an interesting question. Okay, so I would here's say, what, here's you know, what I'm going to do. Consider Hold on, Texas I'm gonna give, to be a country. Hold on, I'm going to give you <laughs> one little hint here. So when we look at three, four, five, six, Ireland, Portugal, Luxembourg, Spain, United Kingdom, Germany, Greece, those all make sense, right? That Europe's doing a lot of that. Yeah. So that's kind of one through whatever. Like an, seven. I bet there's like it's an African two. country. So actually, I think the highest ranking African country is Kenya at 16%. Okay. So who's number two? Uruguay. Really? Okay. I had no idea. That makes sense. I don't even think I could find Uruguay on a map. No, I think that I think that makes sense. I didn't know that, but now that I'm thinking about it. 43%. Okay. Texas has to be getting up there if, Tex if we consider Texas a country. Yeah, Texas has had days where I think 50% of its power is getting almost, power we're getting almost wind Yeah, we're generated. getting almost to 50% on um, certain days. So that's uh, something that a lot of people don't know when you talk about renewables and oil and gas. They always think Texas is an oil and gas state, which it is, obviously. But we're also the leader in the United States for wind power and soon might be a leader in solar yeah, as we're well. Creeping. So. Yeah, I mean, we're just a. a I mean, West Texas is ugly. If we just put a bunch of solar panels over it, that's going to be fine. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, that's yeah, that's always the criticism of solar is you know the footprint and all. But, but the problem is, is transmission. I mean, if the Northeast needs, you know, I, I love, I love picking on the Northeast for energy policy because guess what? You can't use solar panels up there. You can't use, right. you know, you can use wind turbines uh, offshore, but you have limited real estate. The sun doesn't shine much. Um, you know, you have access to hydro, but yeah, you know, I mean, we've got 35 gigawatts of generation out in West Texas. And I think what 12 or 13 gigawatts of actual transmission to where the people are. But that's so, so I was talking to someone who I can't say who it is, but he has, he has access to arguably more energy asset data than anyone in the world at least in the United States. So I'm talking oil and gas deals, renewable deals, okay. and he makes money from all of it. So he's not biased, but he was telling me 
you know, you're just going on a rant about how renewable projects don't make sense. Remove renewable energy credits from these deals. He's like, why is there even such thing as stranded, stranded renewable assets? He's like, they build these things. They don't care about connectivity to the grid. They don't care about transmission. They just want to build as much as they can. And that's actually pretty damaging because you think about it, like why, why do you not have to report renewable energy production like you do oil and gas production? They only report nameplate capacity, but they don't actually right. report, you know, on an individual basis, true actual produced energy. They don't have the same bonding requirements that oil and gas has. So um, people are just building as fast as they can and receiving uh, RECs and like don't really give a shit if it... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I think that you're seeing in West Texas. To some well, I mean, degrees. nobody knows that that nameplate capacity that's based on 25 to 30 mile per hour winds. I mean, I think you have to have 10 to 12 mile per hour winds to even generate any electricity. Yeah. You know, so I mean, five mile per hour wind, those things don't even move. And then also, I mean, they can't operate if wind is too high, like a tornado comes through and right. <laughs> So there's a sweet spot for wind wind production. <laughs> Tornado comes through and just tears them apart. So uh, you can't have too little wind and not too much wind. You just have to have just, just the right, right amount of wind. But yeah, I thought um, I thought that was an interesting conversation with him. Maybe I'll get him on a podcast sometime and uh, we can talk to him about that. But anyways, what do we got next? So this is good news. Hold, if you're for hold on just a second. Yeah. GW Goldman in the comments said, Texas is not a country. Uh, sounds like a Michigan boy. Yeah. That's what that yeah. sounds like. A, a comment from a true Yankee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, we were a country. I think we're the only state that joined the union under treaty. So, uh, no. So, this is, this is interesting is, so, air travel. We have kind of post-COVID stuff had been about, 85% of pre pandemic type levels. Well, the last couple of months have amped up. So March hit 88%. April so far is tracking 91%. The TSA number of passengers that have gone through um, security up 3% last week versus the week before. If you look out international, everybody's up. Canada, Brazil, U.S., all these trips. The only thing that's down is China, and they're down about 20%. And that makes sense because they're on lockdown because of COVID. This has been the one bit of demand for oil that has not come back. And it's not huge. I think it's 20%. Air travel is 15 20% of all oil demand. But boy, if this is skyrocketing back, Demand's just screaming right now. Yeah, demand's screaming. Something interesting that I've seen. I don't know if something's going on, but like at um, Bush International, the security lines for travel are so long. And I've traveled out of that airport, can't tell you how many times, and like never had to wait on security like the lines that I'm seeing. So I don't know if they, um, you know, ratcheted down TSA personnel during covid and just haven't ramped it back up or if there's just more people i mean right there it sounded like you know he said three percent increase in people going through tsa um so just kind of um tan you know some evidence i've seen personally at houston airports like it's definitely packed and it feels like the the proverbial pent up demand you know march is generally spring break so it feels like everybody jumped on an airplane yeah. And it and it bumped up and they enjoyed it. So they're flying yeah. flying again. And conspiracy so this is, theory or theorists in me. Uh you made a comment about China uh shutting down for COVID. I also think a great way to shut down uh, or to suppress rising energy prices and demand for other commodities is lockdowns as well. Um so you know, I think that there I've seen other conspiracy theories too where like, hey, is China locking down to increase uh inflation in the in the United States? So um, you know, I, I think it's uh interesting. The one thing that killed energy demand was COVID lockdowns. And so do you see that happening in the future of people or governments putting restrictions on uh, travel to offices or anything like that to curb energy demand. 
I mean, it's it's sick watching the videos from there. There are people pressing up against fences, screaming for food. I mean, 25 million people in uh, Shanghai, and they're on lockdown, and that's the biggest port. So, I mean, it's I've become the tinfoil hat guy. It's it's not just hanging out with Rando that's done it. It's stuff like this. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the thing that worries me is, is this lockdown because this is a deadly variant? You know, because the information that's going to come out of China is going to be wrong. It's going to be a lie. You never know what's true. Is it a deadly variant? That's unusual because generally variants are, are less virulent as time goes on. So that's a worry. Or is this is this some geopolitical thing having to do with uh, Taiwan? Because I think Taiwan's number one on their list to do. And, you know, how does that fit in? Are we going to yeah. are we going to jack up inflation on the United States? Yeah. So. World's just a uh, crazy place right now. So we'll see. See how it all plays out. All right. Real quick. You did something last weekend at your house and you posted videos of it. Oh, lay it on us. You're now a Bitcoin miner, right? Time I'm, yeah, I'm not officially a Bitcoin miner yet. Uh, if we weren't going to Vegas this week, I was actually like a little upset that we had to go to Vegas this week because my Bitcoin mining is probably going to be pushed off until uh, this coming weekend. In case anyone in the audience wants to know what a geek Colin is, he doesn't want to go to <laughs> Vegas without his wife, <laughs> but wants to be in the backyard Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Hey, look, I, I am a nerd and I'm not ashamed of that. But yeah, um, so I got a black box from Upstream Data. Uh, Steve Barber hooked me up with one and I'm going to put it to the test because I built this platform out in the backyard and I'm going to put the box out there and see how it does in Houston, Texas heat, see if it can keep air circulated because the way that it's built, it's got a divider down the middle with vents on both sides. So you bring in cold air on this side and then hot air goes out on, on this side. So we're going to see if the air circulation works. Got a couple S9 miners, uh, Ryan Leachman over from uh, J Energy hooked me up uh, with one of those. And so I'm not going to feel too bad if I burn up these S9s <laughs> outside. If they were S19s, it'd be... Um, it'll it'll be a little bad yeah um here's a comment right now is except you forgot to run uh comms to it so that's my hold up right now is i had to run 220 lines from my electrical panel in the garage put them through the wall ran them underground if i was smart which i'm not i would have ran a separate conduit with uh, ethernet going to it and just ran a router in my garage but now i gotta go get an electrical box I'm going to put a router in there on top of the mine and then I'll pour it in Ethernet. So by this weekend, should be hashing some corn. And um, and, uh, and discuss the provisions of your house lease with me too. Uh, I cannot do that <laughs> in a public uh, forum. Uh, one, I'm not really familiar with what those terms are, but I'm a guy that likes to ask for uh, forgiveness instead of permission. Not so. for permission. So. <laughs> All righty. Well, you don't even know this because you ran in late, but we've got the finger of the week. Here goes. today is gouged at the gas pump. Um, big oil in America's pain at the pump. They had an option to do that, to increase their ability right now, not to have to frack, not to have to drill more, but to simply at their ability right now to raise the amount of gas that they- <laughs> What the so, fuck? So Col Colin, we, norm about? so we normally do finger of the week, and as I was thinking about it, that was Representative Jan Schakowsky. Schakowsky. And believe it or not, she is actually on the Energy Committee in the House of Representatives. And I was thinking she deserved the finger of the week for saying, hey, you don't have to frack. You don't have to drill more wells. You just need to turn on more gasoline. So I was thinking that was finger of the week. But now, actually... She is like, we're going to put her in the Wildcatters Hall of Fame because she <laughs> has found a source of oil that does not require drilling or fracking. So kudos to her. Yeah, I mean, look, we have been chasing infinite energy 
you know, that is the Holy grail right. of society. So I'm glad that we're able to reach this paradigm shift and society can prosper from but, here on out. Her perpetual motion machine, <laughs> and we uh, we have it now. So uh, anyway, uh, Senator, I mean, uh, Representative Shakowsky, either finger of the week or we'll put you in the Hall of Fame. So <laughs> there we go. All uh, right, what are we doing this week? Uh, this week, uh, Chuck and I will be in Vegas at the Quorum Connections Conference. So if you are there, come check us out. We are speaking tomorrow, Wednesday at 2 o'clock Pacific time. Um, got a really great panel, uh, with a few folks on there from EMPs and from Quorum, uh, talking about the adoption of oil and gas technology. So come check it out. Come hang out with us there. And you got anything to add on that or? That no, I'm just looking forward to the Encore Beach Club tomorrow night after we, uh, <laughs> after we speak. All right. Yeah. If you're in Vegas, uh, come hang out with us at Encore. So we'll catch you guys next week. Uh, if you can help us out, share this with a friend. Um, leave us a comment, subscribe to us on YouTube, and we will catch you guys next week.